Awesome. Well, good morning, church. How are you this morning? Everybody good? Man, it's so good to see you this morning. Amen. Well, you know, I was thinking, um, I, when pastor asked me to speak, I was thinking, what, what can I speak about that is so prevalent in the era that we are living in right now? So I decided to talk about fatal distractions because, my friends, we are surrounded all around our world and our culture, everywhere we look, just distractions, just so many things happening. So I was thinking in Scripture, who is the person who is probably distracted more than anybody else in the entire Bible? And I thought of Samson. So let's go to Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. And we're going to be flipping around a little bit in the book of Judges. But I want to kind of give you the context of this passage and exactly what's happening at this time of Samson's life. First of all, the history is kind of this. At the time of Samson, the Israelites were doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. And he gave them over to be controlled by the Philistines, which happened pretty regularly. The cycle of sin that was taking place with the children of Israel is a pretty common sin, judgment, repentance. Sin, judgment, repentance. Sin, judgment, repentance. And if you didn't realize this in the Old Testament, that method was not working. So there was a better method. And later on, of course, we get Jesus and he kind of fixed that whole problem that was going on. But that was what was happening with the children of Israel. They were experiencing sin, judgment, and repentance. So the angel of the Lord appears to Samson's parents, Judges 13. We're going to pick it up in verse 3. Let's see what happens here. The angel of the Lord appeared to her, this is Samson's mom, and said, You are sterile and childless, but you're going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean, because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head." Because the boy is to be a Nazarite, set apart to God from birth, and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistine. So just a kind of cool thing to think about when you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, and it's all caps, L-O-R-D. That is actually a pre-incarnate Christ speaking. It's called a theophany. So right here, Jesus is speaking to Samson's mom. So we see this theophany. So awesome to see this in Scripture occasionally. But here, here's kind of what the Philistines wanted to happen. Here, here was their plan. Assimilate with the Israelites through intermarriage and slowly watch all of God's people kind of disappear into their own culture and start kind of conforming to the culture of the Philistines. We also see the same thing happen with Nebuchadnezzar as he took the choice Hebrew boys, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He had the same plan, but it didn't really work on those four guys, but it kind of did work here on Samson. So Samson was fully equipped by God to deliver the children of Israel, but he never experienced the deliverance of God because of all of his distractions. Samson wanted to be the main character of the story. The truth is, God is the main character of the story, that story and our story. See, when our story connects to God's story. It leads to a greater story. But Samson wanted to kind of do his own thing. He wanted the leading role. See, we are supposed to be the supporting actors and let God lead us. So let's look at a few of the distractions that Samson uh, experienced down the wrong path. The first thing we see, the very first thing, is he went to the wrong place. If we look at chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. He went down to the Philistine country in his first public act. That's what he did. He headed south both physically and spiritually. Have you ever been at the wrong place at the wrong time? Can I, just, can I just say this? There are some places that we as followers of Christ, if you're a follower of Christ here this morning, there are some places that we just shouldn't go. Do you realize that? Like there's some places you just should avoid. I remember my freshman year of high school, I got invited to a party, and I went to lots of parties in eighth grade. So I thought eighth grade parties are cool, ninth grade parties will be cool. 
So I got invited to this ninth grade party, and um, it was after a football game, and my friends invited me and said, Jody, come on with us and, and hang out with us. I was like, all right, let's go to a party. I told my mom I'm going to a party. She assumed it was a party like an eighth grade party. <laughs> so I get to this eighth, ninth grade party, and I walk in the room, and I'm like, this is not like the eighth grade parties. And I realized I was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. And I felt completely out of place. I didn't go back to any more high school parties after that ninth grade. As a matter of fact, we were in the house. I wasn't doing anything. But let's just say there was plenty of stuff going on with everybody else. And I was sitting there completely out of place. And someone yelled, cops! And everybody started running out the back door. So I just started trucking along the back door with them, jumped a fence, ran like a mile, got completely disconnected with my friend Almeida and Jason, and there was no cell phones in 1991. You couldn't text and say, hey, where are you? I was lost in this neighborhood for about two hours avoiding the cops. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. You see, Samson fought the Lord's battles by day, but he disobeyed the Lord's commands by night. We have to be so careful of this ourselves. He was also, number two, he was looking for the wrong thing. He was looking for a Philistine woman. He wasn't supposed to be doing that. Listen to this parental pep talk found in verse 3 of chapter 14. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all the other people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? Now listen to the way Sam, Samson talks to his mother. But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. So he's talking to his parents in this disrespectful way, and they go and they do what Samson said. There may be nothing more difficult than for a parent to give advice to their child and be completely disregarded without any consideration. And that is exactly what happened here in this story with Samson going to find this Philistine woman. So to sum up, Samson was in the wrong place. He was looking for the wrong thing for the wrong reason. You might say, how could this happen? How could, he, how could he do such a thing? How did he ruin his life all at once? My friends, it happens one step at a time. He took one step away, and it begins to spiral. The third thing we see is he rejected godly counsel. We saw that just now in verse 3. He rejected his father. He rejected his mother. They were talking to him, and he basically said, no, get her for me. Exodus 34, 16, the Israelites are told not to experience intermarriage with other countries and other people, and he disobeyed that. Listen to Deuteronomy 7, 3. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the angel of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. He was completely rejecting what God said in this passage. He simply did not care. We see three different kind of attitudes of Samson. We see, I want it. He wanted the Philistine woman. He was experiencing lust. He wanted this woman. In 16 verse 1, Samson went right to the hub of the Philistine country, right to Gaza. And he traveled 25 miles to risk 20 years of faithful service to God. I did a little math, a little bit of figuring. That's 56,250 steps he took away from God. So how do most people ruin their life? It doesn't happen all at once. It happens one step at a time. You see, sin doesn't start with a blowout. It starts with a leak. And it begins to slowly take over our life if we're not careful. So how could he do this? How could Samson do this? He was supposed to be a Nazarite. My friends, we see this every day. We see people fall every day. There's pastors that fall. There's parents that fall. There's people that just throw in their spiritual towel and say, I give up. 
Now understand, just because we walk away from God does not mean that God walks away from us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never leave you. But you have every right to walk away from him. But you know what's cool? The second you turn around and come back, Luke 15 tells us the Father comes running back to you. But man, it happens one step at a time. He also had the attitude, I deserve it. He was entitled. He was touching something unclean that went against the Nazarite vow. He was not supposed to touch a dead body. And he was messing around with this lion that he killed. He was not supposed to do that. He, we also see pride. He says, I can handle it. He puts himself around alcohol. He goes through a vineyard. That's not really a wise place for someone who's to have nothing to do with grapes or strong drink or anything like that, according to the Nazarite vow. He shows no sense of repentance in his next actions in chapter 14, verse 10, when he throws basically a bachelor party with the Philistines. And another interpretation of this, a better interpretation, it's a feast. Basically, he's having a drinking party with his enemies. There's a problem with this. He's not paying attention to his Nazareth vow. He is saying, I can handle it. No problem. Samson assumed his disobedience wouldn't cost him, and it ended up costing him everything. He also, number four, he compromised his commitment. He continued in this wrong relationship. So he kills the lion, doesn't tell his parents, He's now ceremonially unclean. In verse 8 of 14, he goes back to see the dead lion, sees the bees, sees the honey, scoops it out, touches it again, and he gives some to his parents without telling them. Samson is flirting with sin, and he's right in the midst of living a sinful life. I want to share with you now something that I, I would say if you will follow this, it will help you tremendously in your future as you deal with temptations and sin. It's called the progression of sin. And I've used this for many years, and it's helped me many times get out of situations and just understanding how sin originates. So as we see the progression of sin, it's five steps. The first is impure thoughts. Sin starts with a thought. Do you realize that? It starts here. Like this is, this is the most important thing you got to deal with is your, is your mind. Where do we get these impure thoughts? TV, music, magazines, internet, friends, and all these thoughts come into our mind. And we have to protect our mind. We have to be so careful what we allow to go into our mind. And then the next step is rationalization. You've probably heard your kids say this. I've heard my kids say this. Something like this. Well, everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing, we begin to rationalize our thoughts. Or we say something like this, well, you know, it's, it's not that big a deal. Everybody's doing it. It's not a big deal. And we rationalize what's going into our mind. And the third, we compromise. We say, you know what? I'm just going to try just a little bit. Not enough to do this or that or whatever, but I'm just going gonna, gonna to taste it or I'm going to look at it, or I'm going to go to it, or I'm going to experience it just a little bit. And then we see loss of control. Soon you become addicted, and you do whatever you can to get what it is that you're desiring. Whatever it takes, you'll do it. And then it leads to the downfall. And this is where you're completely enthralled in sin, and you act accordingly. You do whatever it takes. Now, the two people in Scripture that you can best line up the progression of sin with are Samson and King David when he was walking on the roof and he caught Bathsheba. These two guys went directly into these five progressions of sin. So here's the catch. Guard your heart. Guard your mind. Be careful what comes in here. Make sure it is of God. Make sure you don't continue spiraling out of control in the progression of sin. Samson is beginning to bail on his commitment. 
But you know what? If you look at his hair, you think he's dedicated to God. You think everything is great. But his lifestyle is speaking louder. On the outside, he looks like a man of God. But on the inside, he's controlled by his lust and his desires. Samson, in chapter 16, begins to taunt the enemy with Delilah. He's taunting sin. You know, we put ourselves in compromising situations. And then we're surprised when we're tempted to sin. If you put yourself in situations, very oftentimes you will be tempted to sin. Some of you in here, you might be single. Or maybe you're married. And you know what? You have all these boundaries. You have all these fences kind of set around you. And your convictions. You get pre-made decisions that you've already experienced. But then you meet somebody. And you're like, you know what? Man, we, we could spend the night. Just, just come on over. It's not that big a deal. Just, just spend the night. No one will know. No one really cares. Just, just come on over. And your boundaries all of a sudden start coming down. You're strong when you're not in the situation. But then you get put in the situation and all of a sudden you're like, eh, it doesn't really matter. We could stay in the same room in a hotel. I mean, nothing's going to happen. We love Jesus. My friends. Some of the most spiritual people I know can do some of the most dumbest things possible when they're put in a compromising situation. Maybe you're married and you go on a business trip and you say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to the hotel bar. I'm just going to have a drink. It's been a long day. One drink turns to two, two to three. Your morals get a little loose. And all of a sudden you meet somebody and you begin to have an inappropriate conversation that you really shouldn't have had. You're like, nobody knows. It's not that big a deal. Let me tell you something. Samson's life is a warning to us not to give in to the desires of the flesh. And those desires are strong. We got to protect ourselves. We have to be careful. But fifth, he, con- he ignored his weakness. You know what his weaknesses were? Revenge and romance. Samson was a player. I mean, he was all about the women. He was like the life of the party, and it's obvious. If you just read these chapters, you're going to be like, man, Samson, he was, yes, he was. Those were his weaknesses, revenge and romance. Judges 16, verse 1, I want you to look at it with me. It says this, one day Samson went to Gaza. One day. Everybody say with me, one day. One day. It only takes one day to begin making really bad decisions. Samson went to Gaza, the enemy territory. And Samson fell in love and he stopped listening to his parents. Stopped listening to counsel because he was in love. And sometimes we need to allow other people to speak truth into our life. You know, sometimes we need to allow other people to say what they see. And Samson's parents were very concerned, and he just didn't care. He was experiencing the lust of the eyes. 1 John 2.16 says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And Samson was all up in the lust of the eyes. I want to read Judges 16, 15 through 21. I want you to follow along just this story. And y'all, listen, this story is absolutely crazy. I mean, the Bible is not, you realize that's not G, right? It's not G rated. Like it's like 17-ish. This is, this is going on. Listen to this. Let's see what happens here in verse 15. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines. 
come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with silver in their hands. Having put them to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair. You can only imagine how long Samson's hair was from never having a haircut. And so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He woke up from his sleep and thought, I'll go out before and shake these things loose just as before. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. You see, Samson was strong enough to kill a thousand men. He was strong enough to slay a lion with his bare hands. He was strong enough to pick up a 700-pound door and walk it out of the city. But he was not strong enough to lead his wife. It's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. Men, don't just be strong in your business, in your companies, in your job, in your sports, in your workout routine. Be strong with your children. Be strong leading your family well. Be strong. I wonder how many of us in here are doing battle every day in our own strength. You know, we're forgetting to tap into the power of God. God's strength left him, and he didn't even know. What a tragedy. It's our refusal to deal with our weaknesses that get us into the most trouble. And we don't want to deal with it. We just want to avoid it. Samson was unpredictable. He was completely undependable and completely double-minded. James 1.8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all he does. Samson was unstable. He was trying to have it both ways. And it doesn't work that way. You can't have it both ways. God wants you to be all in or all out, not in the middle. So we often do anything to avoid these issues. Man, we just think everything's okay. You know what? It's okay this morning to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. Some of you this morning, let's just be honest, you are not okay. This story of Samson right now, you're like, I need to get out my phone. I need to check scores from last night. Gators lost. Nothing else really matters. And you're thinking, man, I just, I need to get distracted because I don't want to hear this. It's okay to not be okay. But don't you dare leave this place staying that way. God's spirit is trying to speak to you. Allow him to talk to you through his word. Now, before you say, you know what, I... I don't understand. That, that could never be me. There's a verse that's often overlooked in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. The reason it's overlooked is because it comes right before 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, which is probably the most important, powerful verse in all of Scripture about temptation. But 1 Corinthians 10, 12, you know what it says? Listen to these words. So if you think you were standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Don't you ever think you got this life figured out. Don't you ever think, I could never do that. When I hear of a Christian man or woman of God falling, I don't say, oh, how could they do that? You know what I say? I better be careful. That's what I say. I start examining my own life and say, is there anything I'm doing that could cause me to do that? Don't ever think that you couldn't do something or you could easily fall. Samson is in decline. And it began when he disagreed with his parents about marrying a Philistine girl. Then he dishonored his Nazarite vow. And then he disregarded the warnings of God. And he disobeyed the word of God. And he was defeated by the enemies of God. Interesting that it started with disobeying his parents and doing what he thought he should do instead of what they thought he should do. Proverbs 25, 28 says, Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. My friends, I'm here to tell you, Samson lacked 
self-control. But Samson's hair began to grow again. His hair, it started growing. There's a ray of light. He's starting to kind of believe and trust God again. He had one last opportunity to defeat the enemy and glorify God. Let's not be too hard on a man who was willing to give his life in one last attempt to serve the Lord. Let's not be too hard on him. He gave his life to serve God in the last moments of our life. So let's look now at what do we do with these distractions? What's God's solution to our distractions? Because, friends, we are so distracted with all the things happening in our world. So what's God's solution? What do we do? We see kind of what Samson did, and we see at the very last, he kind of came right back, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But what do we do? How do we combat against the enemy? What do we do? The first thing we got to do is allow God to empower us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our power source. Because of his waywardness, God used his other trusted servant, Samuel, to end the Philistines in 1 Samuel 7. There were only two guys in the Old Testament set apart from God as a Nazarite from the beginning of their life, Samuel and Samson. Samson kind of blew it, so God used Samuel to fix the problem, and he completely wiped out in 1 Samuel 7 the rest of the Philistines. You see, here's what you got to know. The Holy Spirit is the only way you get to win. You don't win without him. So really the pressure is off of you. We want all the pressure on ourselves. We, we want to do what's right. We want to always strive to be the best. But here's what you really need to know. You need to stop trying and let the Holy Spirit lead you. There's a big difference. I was thinking of how I could illustrate this. And the best way I can think is, you know, I'm sitting at my, my computer, you know. You've been at your computer, and you're sitting there, and you're like, okay, I'm, I can't figure this out. And you're hitting the buttons, and you're doing system preferences, and looking over here at all these things, and you're like, I can't figure it out, but I want to. And you keep trying, and an hour goes by, and two hours go by, so you do what everybody does. You call a millennial, and they come... <laughs> And they stand beside you and they watch you. They watch you. And you say, just, just stand there. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And you continue on trying to fix the problem. And the millennial is just standing there. And he knows or she what the problem is. But you're trying to find it. But they know. So instead of just saying, hey, can you just take over and fix this for me? You try to fix it yourself. I just realized I just compared the Holy Spirit to millennial. <laughs> That's cool. So here's what you got to know. The Holy Spirit doesn't need you to try to figure it out. He needs you to get out of the way. Amen. And he will lead you. He will direct you. His names are the counselor, the comforter, the convictor. Some of you are convicted right now. That's not me. I'm just a dude. That's the Holy Spirit convicting you of your sin. Let him. Let him speak to you. Let him lead you. Let him direct you. Let him comfort you. We tend to think, I got this. You don't have anything without him. The only thing that is good in me is Jesus, not me. And you need to understand that. You need to get that. Here's the scary thing. If you don't allow God to use you for his kingdom and his great story, he will use someone else. But we, we, we tend to think, you know, man, God needs me, man. You know, <laughs> what would he do without me? God doesn't need you. You need him. And you want to be a part of his story. Not he played the second role to your story. That's not the way it works. Don't be passed by by God. 
You know, one of the sad things about Samson, yeah, he did some cool things that we're going to see in a minute, but he went to Samuel because Samuel did exactly what he said. Man, God will just use someone else. I don't want God to use someone else. I want God to use me. So allow yourself to be empowered through the Holy Spirit. But second, fervent prayer. Man, experience fervent prayer. What is it? It's deep, focused, and passion-filled prayer. It's a petition to God. Now, I'm really good at casual prayer, aren't you? I'm walking in my neighborhood. I'm casually praying, God, you're good. Yeah, okay, let me check my phone. Hey, let's do this. Hey, hey, hey. And I'm just kind of walking. I'm talking about fervent prayer, a deep, passion-filled petition to God, the kind of prayer that we see in Scripture where Hannah prayed for a son, and she got saved, and where Daniel prayed. Remember Daniel? Like he was in the lion's den. You better believe he was praying. And God protected him. That's the kind of prayers we need to see. But let's look here at Judges 16, 28. Let's see how Samson prayed. I love this verse. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me, O God. Please strengthen me just one once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. He prayed fervently. And we know that Samson and the Lord were back to being okay with each other. Why do we know this? Because Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Father will not hear me. What does that mean? That means if you go to God holding on your sin so tight, and it is your pet sin, and you love that sin, and you're trying to get the blessings of God by praying, but yet you go to God like this, grasping your sin, God doesn't hear you. Yeah. Man, we don't go to the Almighty like this. We go to the Almighty like this. Open. Confess sin before him. Agreeing with God of what we've done and understand that we are sinners and he is holy you want God to hear your prayer? Make sure you're confessed up. Confession is simply just agreeing with God about your sin. And he says if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But you have to confess. Third, you have to educate yourself in his word. Educate yourself in his word. My friends, you simply need to know scripture. Like read it for yourself. Get online. Go to a couple sites. Go to this site I use a lot called gotquestions.org. I've researched the site. I trust the site. It's amazing. It answers like thousands of questions. And start infiltrating your life with the answers of Scripture instead of the advice of others. Man, be filled with God's Word. Have a plan. Like, actually have a plan. Develop some convictions. A conviction is a pre-made decision. A conviction is something that you decide before you're ever put in the situation. Set up boundaries around yourself. A good fence will keep the bad out and the good in. You need spiritual fences around you. So when you're weak, that fence protects you. But sometimes we're just wide open and we just allow ourselves just, we just open up ourselves and we just go with our emotions. And my friend, don't go with just your emotions. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You need some convictions. You need some boundaries. Number four is have some pursue relationships with Christian friends. Have some relationship with Christian friends. Let's look at chapter 14, verses 15 through 19. Let's see what happens here. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to rob us? 
Then Samson's wife threw him, herself on him, sobbing, you hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, he replied. So why would I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. She in turn explained the riddle to her people. Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town basically discovered the riddle. These guys weren't Samson's friends. They threatened to kill his family. And a matter of fact, they did kill his wife and her father. Samson did not have good influences around him. We're crazy to think we can do this life alone. If you come into this service today and you have no community in our church outside of this room, you are missing what biblical community is all about. You need people around you to support you. You need people around you to pray for you and love you and be there when you're hurting. Please be a part of the community of God. Don't just come here. This is important. But so is biblical community. And so is Christian friends and influences. These guys burned his wife and father. You know, cutting people off, amputating a relationship should be the last resort. But sometimes it's necessary. If you're a new Christian today and you're still hanging out with the same people that you've always hung out with, Sometimes you have to break off, amputate those relationships for a season, get closer to God, and then maybe go back to those people and try to pull them into the kingdom of God. But sometimes we have to break off relationships so that we can draw closer to God. Friends influence you. Relationships matter. And last, we have to limit our intake of entertainment. Man, we got, we got our TVs, we got the internet, we got movies, we got music, we got Spotify, we got Apple Music. We just play anything and watch anything and do anything and go anywhere, and we think that it doesn't matter. And I'm here to tell you, it matters. Be prepared to make some changes. Be prepared to make some changes. Repair. Reconfigure. Reverse, repent. You know what repent means? You're going in this direction, you stop and you turn and you go in another direction. Some of you right now, you're going in this direction and you need to stop and you need to turn and you need to go in that direction. It's called the broad road that leads to destruction and the straight and narrow road that leads to everlasting life. This is where God wants you to be. Repent. Change. Here's the crazy thing to me. Hebrew 11, Hebrews 11.33. 11, you know who's found in the hall of fame of scripture? Samson. Samson. He's in the Hall of Fame. Hebrews 11 is the Hall of Fame of all the Christian characters in the Bible. And right there after one is Samson and comma, another one. Not a lot of info about it, but he's in the Hall of Fame. And I'm like, how is that possible? You know why? Because the end of his life, Samson recognized his complete dependence on God and that he couldn't do it without him. Yes, it took him a while to get it. He struggled with it. But when he died, God turned his failures and defeats into victory. And God used him to his very last breath. And that's what God wants to do to you this morning. But he wants you to start now. He doesn't want you to wait like Samson did to literally his last breath. He wants you to start now. Samson's story teaches us that it is never too late to start over. No matter how bad you have failed in the past, today is not too late for you to put your complete trust in God. You say, Jody, you don't know what I've done. Really? Did you listen to this story? Have you read the Old Testament? 
Have you heard about the disciples? There is nothing that you've done that God can't fix. God is in the business of making us better and making us more like Christ. All he needs you to do is get out of his way and let him lead you and let him direct you and watch what God will do in and through you. Maybe this morning you need to admit some things to God. Maybe you just need to take a moment of confession. Maybe you've taken a step away. Maybe not 56,250 steps, but maybe one, or maybe five, or maybe 10, maybe more. My friends, God is here waiting. God is here waiting on you. He is saying this morning, come back to me. I am here. I am waiting for you. All you have to do is take that step. What areas of your life this morning is there just some dust building up, some dirt building up? If we're to see your heart, your spiritual heart, is there a dark corner over here that's got a bunch of dust and a bunch of dirt that you need to allow the Holy Spirit to come in here and just sweep it away? Don't be afraid to let God search your heart. Don't be afraid to do a full examination of your spiritual life and watch what God will do for you if you will simply come back to him. I close with this verse, Proverbs 4, 25 through 27. There's no greater proverb to describe the life of Samson than this one right here. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the pass of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. My friends, that verse is not just about Samson or us. It's about you. It's about me. Are you on the straight and narrow right now? Or are you taking steps away from God? Will you bow your heads for just a second? Close your eyes. I want right now, I want you just to do some soul searching. All week as I prepared this, I promise you, I did some soul searching. And it was not fun and it was not easy. But I want you right now to search your heart, search your soul. And I want you, just as King David said, search me, O God, in all my ways. Try me in all my anxious thoughts and see if there is any wicked offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Men, are you leading your families well? Are you loving your wife as Christ loved the church? Are we following God with all of our heart? Or are we settling for mediocrity? Are we just kind of doing our own thing and acting on our emotions? Have you taken a step away from God? Have you taken 10 steps away from God? So right now, what I want you to do, just in the quietness of this moment, I want you to pray. And I want you to search your heart. No one is here in this room but you and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to speak to him and say, Holy Spirit, point out anything in me that is offensive to you. Do that right now. with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. No one's looking around but me. If you would just be honest right now before God, not before me, not before your spouse sitting next to you, your kids or whoever's sitting next to you, but honest before God right now in this moment. And you say, Jody, you know what? Pray for me because I have taken a step away. It's just one step or it's just 10 but I need to get back on the path that God has for me. If that's you, would you just real quick, would you just kind of raise your hand, let me see so I can pray for you. I'm not gonna call you out or make you stand up or do anything like that. Really you're doing it as under the Lord, nobody else. There's a lot of hands going up, 
a lot of people have taken steps away. My friends, you can put your hands down. Let me tell you, God is a God of second chances. All it took was for Samson to clear that relationship with God, and guess what? He got right back where he needed to be, and God used him. So right now, if you lifted your hand, just take a moment, pray, and ask God to help you on your spiritual journey. Ask him to get you back where you need to be and take those steps back to the right path. But also, maybe you're here this morning, and you'd say, Jody, you know, if I'm honest with you, I've never began a relationship with God through Jesus. I've never invited Jesus into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Let me tell you something, friends. Your first issue is not dealing with things you've done. Your first issue is dealing with God and how to get connected to him. And the only way, Scripture says, to connect with God the Father is through his son, Jesus. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the bridge from mankind to God. So if you're here and you'd say, Pastor Jody, you know what, if I'm honest, I don't have a relationship with God through Jesus, but I want that. I'm not gonna make you stand up or call you out, but if that's you and you'd be honest and just say, I want to begin a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Would you just raise your hand and let me see? Anybody like that? Okay, all right. That was a lot of hands. All right, thank you. So if it's your desire right now to put your faith, hope, trust in Jesus alone for salvation, I'm gonna ask you just to pray this prayer after me. The Bible says very clearly that none of us do good. We can't get to heaven by doing good. None of us are righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God gave his love towards us while we were still in our sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The only way for you to have a relationship with God is if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if that is your desire this morning, I just want to pray this prayer. Not out, you don't have to pray it out loud. You can pray it in your heart. But I want you to pray this prayer and follow after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I know that I've messed up. But I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you arose again on the third day. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for taking me to heaven when I die. Now help me to live for you. If you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, the Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing over one lost sinner who has come home. So if you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you meant it, would you just real quick raise your hand so I can know that? Keep it up so I can make sure I get a good idea. I see at least eight to 10 hands. Praise God. Praise God for you. Praise God, brother. You can put your hands down. I'll just ask you, I'm going to be in the lobby after church. If you would just come talk to me and let me know that you just made that decision and you just became my new brother in Christ, please let me know that. The rest of us, watch out for the distractions. Be careful. Keep your foot from evil. Walk so close to God. Don't think, how close can I get to sin without sinning? Think, how close can I get to God? My friends, he wants the best for you. He wants to use you in amazing, powerful ways. Let's let him. Amen.